with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Today, October 16th, 1555, Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley were martyred for their faith under Queen Mary, condemned as heretics by the Roman Catholic Church. Both men were bishops in the newly formed Church of England, serving under Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, who crafted the Book of Common Prayer and many other things. Cranmer would be martyred later and later and sadly would witness the burning of his two friends. The three of them were famously called the Oxford Martyrs. They were the core influencers of the English Reformation under King Henry VIII, but particularly under his son Edward, who was very drawn towards the Protestant direction, yet sadly died very young. This would lead then to Queen Mary, who was determined to bring England back to Rome, and many Protestant clergy were killed. But at the end of her reign brought about Elizabeth, where the nation went back again Protestant and remained. Um, Certainly not that way today, in my opinion. Um, Certainly isn't Protestant at all, Um, nor Catholic. It's very pluralistic. But Latimer and Ridley were such strong leaders of the church. Ridley was, at a, at a time, um, Cranmer's chaplain for a season, but then would be appointed to a significant position to be Bishop of London. He was a preacher beloved of his congregation, and the scriptures were such a focus of his life at home and in the church. He highly encouraged scripture memorization. <clears throat> It's also why in our gospel hymn we sang of the Holy Scriptures, reminder of their love for the very Scriptures, the very Word of God. And an equally beloved preacher and student of the Bible, Latimer, who served as Bishop of Worcester, encouraging the Scriptures to be known in English for the common people to hear in their own um, language, the Bible. Um, His preaching emphasized service towards the Lord, where one's affections and loves would be so stirred up that their whole lives would would be one of of um of living the life of the christian and he was also renowned for his love of working amongst those in prison he would care for inmates and seek to minister towards them now when mary was enthroned one of her very first acts was to arrest and trial these two men The key confrontation was in regard to their position on the authority of the Pope and also on the Eucharist. Uh, When Ridley was asked if he believed the Pope was heir to the authority of Peter as the foundation of the church, he replied, the church was not built on any man, but on the truth Peter confessed, that Christ was the Son of God. He said he could not honor this Pope since the papacy was seeking its own glory, not the glory of God. And when confronted on the matter of the Eucharist, both of them could not accept the Roman position. Latimer replied, quote, Christ made one oblation and sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, and that a perfect sacrifice, neither needeth um, there to be, nor can there be any other propitiatory sacrifice. End quote. Well, these claims of faith were the signs Rome declared to be heretical, and therefore the queen ordered their execution by fire. Um, their, martyr, their martyrdom was highly significant. Can you imagine being under the ministry and the spiritual authority of these men of faith, and then years later only to see them being killed um, just outside? Um, Even as they were brought before the flames, their prayers and their sufferings were noted and remembered. As Ridley was being tied to the stake, he prayed, O Heavenly Father, I give unto thee most hearty thanks, that thou hast called me to be a professor of thee, even unto death. I beseech thee, Lord God, 
have mercy on this realm of England and deliver it from all her enemies. Ridley would suffer the worst of it, where the flames burned his lower body without touching his upper. His cries were such cries of mercy to the Lord, crying out, I cannot burn. Let the fire come upon me, I cannot burn. And bystanders would come throwing wood upon the fire to release them from their pain and their suffering. The people loved these men. Latimer died much more quickly, and he would encourage his brother Ridley in his own famous dying words that are still heard out to this day. Be of good comfort, Mr. Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light a, such a candle by God's grace in England, as I trust never shall be put out. And five months later, Thomas Cramer would join them in the flame. We cannot forget such significant men who gave their lives for the gospel. There are a variety of saints such as these whose sacrifice contributed to our existence as an Anglican church in North America. And these men truly heeded the words of Jesus from our gospel today. They did not fear those who killed the body, but truly feared the Lord and trusted in the revealed God of Holy Scripture. All of our readings today are appointed for a commemoration of a martyr. So whenever there's a martyr, we hear these readings. And I find that the reading from our gospel to be the most fitting for these dear saints today. And so if you'd like to open that up in your order of worship, please feel free. We'll be going through this text. So the context of what's going on here of Jesus' teachings ironically involve the religious who are plotting to kill Jesus. Okay, And Jesus gives this warning to his disciples to beware the leaven of the Pharisees. In other words, beware their teaching, which is subtle, and what may give the appearance of truth, or sounds appealing to the ears, but is more dangerous than you realize. Jesus' teachings were clearly opposing the Pharisees, much like Latimer and Ridley, where the warned leaven will bear fruit in putting those who uphold the truth to death. Yet Jesus here speaks of two different kinds of fears when faced with those seeking to destroy you. Um, even in such destruction um, would be your death. And so first Jesus says, do not fear those who kill the body. And I love this line. And after that, have nothing more that they can do to you. What a great line. This reminds me of the appropriate reformational hymn, which boldly declares, The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. They may harm your body, but they cannot touch that which is eternal. They have no place in thwarting your eternity. Rather, Jesus says, we are to fear God. But these are not the same kinds of fear. The first is the call to not be afraid of those who kill the body. But the second is a fear of reverence and awe of the eternal God who is unperishable, everlasting, and is the authority of eternity. Persecutors of the faithful and blasphemers of the Holy Spirit should be afraid of him. Yet for those who see him for who he is revealed, in the face of Jesus Christ, we are not afraid, but we are called to be reverent in awe of his character and his goodness towards us. And Jesus even next reveals such goodness here to deepen awe and reverence of this God. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. In other words, sparrows, dime a dozen, okay? They are cheap and easily forgotten. Yet Jesus makes the claim that what is so easily dismissed is never forgotten by him, is never overlooked by him. In the vastness of this God's knowledge, he even knows the insignificant number of hairs upon your head. Now, I could make a ball joke right now, okay? But um, my father-in-law might actually be watching this. I don't know. Maybe he is, maybe he's not. But the guy is basically Mr. Clean, okay? Um, which, you know, Mr. Clean is literally, he looks like a ball, 
earring, white t-shirt. That's him. That's my father-in-law. And so it um, makes God's job a little bit easier to count the hairs on his head. There, I made the joke. Sorry, Dad. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but such an intimate knowledge of you personally, and even Jesus reminding us of God's vast knowledge of hares and sparrows, is to hear, fear not. Fear not. You are of more value than this. Jesus says similar sayings throughout the Gospels for us to consider the lilies of the field, to, to consider the birds of the air. They're looked after by their creator, and how much more is God concerned and cares for you? Fear not. You have this God in your corner. Now, in light of such reverence and awe of how God relates to us um, and his authority over eternity, wouldn't you want everyone to know or be exposed to such a God who cares amidst a chaotic and ungracious world? We are called to acknowledge Jesus, the Son of Man, before men. We're called to stand for the truth, to acknowledge Christ in our lives, not to show how awesome or how right we are, but to show Christ and his saving grace towards all people. Jesus reveals the eternal dimension of his words. We would be acknowledged, he says, or made known in the heavens, yet those who deny Christ shall be denied before the angels of God. Now, what does it mean to deny Jesus? Right? It seems like it would be very important for us to consider this. One can't help but think, whenever you think of denial, at least I can't help but think of another great saint. And that, of course, is St. Peter, the denier. Right? St. Peter, who at the night of Jesus' arrest denied Jesus three times. Um, those denials, of course, were predicted by Jesus. And Peter was adamant, no, 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 I won't ever do this. And yet we see quite clearly how quickly, in the same night, that he lives up to that. Yet in his own denial, the gospel writers reveal that Peter wept bitterly. He knew that such a denial cut him to the heart. And despite his own denials, after the women witnessed the resurrection, he was the first apostle to run to the empty tomb. He was the apostle who, when seeing Jesus on the shore, jumped in the waters to go after him. And he, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the first to give a sermon that led to thousands of people believing and getting baptized. You see, even when one denies Christ through faith and repentance, your denials can be redeemed. And this is what, why immediately after teaching on denial, Jesus then says this, And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. Wow, that despite our frail words, Jesus' word of forgiveness still stands for us. And this is why every week, friends, we come confessing all of our words, our thoughts, our deeds, things left done and undone. And once again, the word of forgiveness is declared over you, and peace is truly exchanged. Perfect love casts out all fear. And perfect love in the kingdom of God is the forgiveness of sins and the cross. Now this is love, John tells us. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Despite all that seeks to condemn us in this world, when we acknowledge our Lord, Jesus' blood acknowledges us and defends us before any enemy. Friends, that is Christian courage. That builds courage in us. But we hear something strange next, and it's what all people, when they hear Jesus' teachings, go to. And it, of course, is this, what is not forgiven? It's a strange saying by Jesus. And what many Christians have feared to somehow commit without ever knowing, did I commit this sin? Will I stand unforgiven? And this is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? And is there something in my life that stands unforgiven? Well, let's unpack that a little bit. This is not the first time, by the way, that Jesus teaches about this. 
He's taught at many other places in the Gospels. And in those places, we actually hear him revealing what it means. Um, the Pharisees, this is the context of him unpacking it, the Pharisees witnessed Jesus cast out various demons. Yet they claimed Jesus to be the devil. Um, they claimed Jesus in his works of miracles to be acting from Satan. That Satan is casting out Satan. And these are the religious, those who know the scriptures better than most people. And they not only reject Jesus to be the Messiah, but identify him with the demonic. But even if they deny Jesus as the Messiah, they're looking upon divine miracles, which are clearly God's work, and calling them evil and demonic. Their hearts are hardened against the gospel, and such a hardening cannot receive the forgiveness of sins. Because to them, even the forgiveness of sins is evil and demonic. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is willful, deliberate, and intentional in its claims. It's not something done by accident or even unknown. To quote one theologian, the sin is committed in a willful declaration that the Holy Ghost is the spirit of the abyss that truth is a lie, and that Christ is Satan himself. Now, as Jesus teaches the negative of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, we see this, this change-up. We see the positive or opposite of the true work of the Spirit. When one actually stands for what is true, and he's speaking directly to the apostles here, but obviously applies to us, and certainly and especially to Ridley and Latimer, is that we rely upon the same Spirit to teach us what to say in these tense moments of persecution. You see, all of the apostles face some measure of persecution, and nearly all of them, with the exception of John, were martyred for their stand for the gospel. Latimer and Ridley stood with them too. These apostles were before other religious people and rulers and authorities which these groups can naturally make anyone feel anxious to stand before. And, um, and wondering in their own defense the consequences of their words, of what would come next for them. Yet Jesus gives them and us courage. Because he doesn't say, well, rely upon your own winsomeness, or, or formulate your arguments defensively in right order, and as a rhetorician would, or even think too much about what you're going to say. No, he says that the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. What miraculous is that? And the Holy Spirit, we see, will never teach against the gospel which has brought you to such persecution. In fact, he will lead you once again back to Jesus. As Jesus promised us in the Gospel of John, Quote, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. And so it is with us. Now probably, I don't want to promise this, but probably none of us will face the persecution the apostles um, of the early church or even the apostles of the Reformation faiths. I can't guarantee that for you, but, but most likely not. But we will be placed in situations where our faith will be challenged, where you may face ridicule, bullying, or even the threat of cancel culture. Um, and we will be called to speak, that is, to acknowledge the Son in those moments, to hold on to the faith once delivered to us, and to rely upon the Holy Spirit to speak through us. Um, it may not be entirely eloquent or, or um, change the minds of your persecutors. In fact, it may intensify the minds of your persecutors. But let us never be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the very power of God to save a candle, friends, did shine forth in the martyrdom of Latimer and Ridley. The light of Christ was displayed. 
even in their deaths. And such a light shines on in our mission here. In closing, Jesus' teaching reveals our mission within the life and power of the triune God. We are not afraid, for we are known and cared by our Heavenly Father. We acknowledge the Son and claim Him in all areas of our lives, for His forgiving grace redeems all of our days, even our denials. And we rely upon the Holy Spirit to speak through us the consistent word of the gospel. This is the God we worship this morning, friends. This is the God we give our lives over and even lay our lives down. And why? Why do we do such a thing? It's because he is the God who always gives himself to us. A God who gives himself to you, a God who gives himself for you. And once again, we come to this table to receive him, to be nourished and fed by him and to be sent out where the gospel really truly would light such a candle in the region of Ohio, as I trust shall never be put out. Amen.